I noticed that you played some memory games also with the kids. That after you did the sandwich thing mm -hmm. and so on. What What do you think about the role of memory in kids memorizing number facts in this process? Oh, I think that um, again, I want to build the foundation of understanding, and then the memory comes on top. So. What would happen after these games is that we would do all kinds of memory exercises to reinforce the structure that they've already gained. Mm -hmm. So they would, um, we play, you know, roll the dice and find two numbers and add them, or, you know, put out two cards and add <coughs> them. Most of it's all game oriented. I don't use flashcards, but if you put out two cards and add them, they think that's really exciting, much more exciting than putting a flashcard out that says nine plus four. Mm -hmm. So, because it generates new ones every time, and there's something exciting right. about generating new ones every time. So, yeah, after they have this, you mean like two cards with yes. each with digits, digits and just select numbers. them at yes. random. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Or rolling a dice and finding two right. numbers at random. That's right. much more fun right. than doing a piece of paper that's that has a whole bunch of right. addition facts on it. Um, but yes, we do a lot of practicing and getting it so that they're very solid and very fast at their facts. Right. But once they've had a foundation of it, because I think some kids think there's hundreds of facts that are isolated and not related, and I want them to see how they're all related and to see the structure of them before I have them memorize. But you think but it's yes. important for oh, them definitely. to memorize? Definitely. In fact, did you see that I had them close? No, sometimes I have them close their eyes and imagine what we just did in their yeah. mind or take a picture of it. So, yeah, they get a visual memory, and then they can also call upon that visual memory when they need to find the facts. The visual memory is a memory of the structural materials? Is that what, I is that what it is? I think for a lot of them, it, it, they, 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 can mem they can see that structure in their memory, yeah. Do they report that? Do they? Yes, in fact, I'll say, can you tell me what's next? And they'll, in their mind, they'll, say, they'll close their eyes and say it's an 8 and a 2, and a 7 and a 3, and a 6 and a 4, yeah. That's what abacus users users can do that too. They can mm -hmm. see it mentally and do these incredible mental calculations mm -hmm. yeah. with an abacus in their head. Yeah. So I'm convinced. Yeah, I didn't have these when I was young, but I'm convinced that you would they would begin can continue to see the structure, and this would help build the foundation in their mind. Mm -hmm. And you and we saw how you introduced multiplication as essentially skips on the number line with mm -hmm. with the with the concrete representation. Yes. And that helps a lot with division. So if you see on that number line there, if you see that you know three fives is 15. So then later on, I can say five, I mean, excuse me, 15, divided by fives is three. You can see the three on top. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's very nice. And you can see I connected addition and subtraction all the time. I connect the multiplication and the division all the time, so that when you learn one, you learn the other. Do you usually teach them simultaneously? Yeah. Well, I today I was introducing multiplication, and then the, the division will come right along, kind of next. But with addition and subtraction, we teach them simultaneously. Because you see that if you know 8 and 2 make 10, and if you take away 2, you have 8. And so I teach them as back families simultaneously. Right. And so right. actually, structural arithmetic does too. It teaches right. the addition and the subtraction together. Right. Could we say you're excited about this program? Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I really think that kids benefit from it. Yeah. Um, and I've, it's been a joy to share it with other teachers in the school who have just um, come up with even new ideas. See, that's what's fun about it is they'll come to me and they'll say, I have a new worksheet that you can try out or a new game or, you know, this is what this child did or that child. So it's it's really fun to share with other teachers. And that's okay with the founders of the program? To, uh, we have, we're going to put Fred on camera just a little. Come on over here. Yeah. Fred. I didn't mean to, to take Ari oh, away. That's oh, fine. Okay, <laughs> come away. <laughs> It's uh, wonderful to have Fred Stern here, too, and uh, who has worked on developing the program and interpreting it for people. And is it okay if people change it a bit and, and add new activities? And I think something? it's important. I think you, just like with the kids, you want them to extrapolate from what their, their experience is mm -hmm. to think about new things or to extend the nine table you know, further and so forth, and you want teachers to bring that creativity. And the issue is that we have a well-developed program with lots of activity books and a long tradition uh, of we using... We might even back up just a little bit that, okay. to, to give a context, because okay. 
I don't want to give me too much credit here. This was developed by my grandmother, uh, starting in the late 1930s and 40s, um, after she'd worked in a Montessori school. Mm -hmm. And then she'd had a, a PhD in physics and was particularly interested in, in abstract mathematics, but wanted to see how that could be brought alive for kids. Mm -hmm. so, so the goal was always abstract mathematics. Absolutely. But to really understand, and right. that was very striking about what we saw today was how abstract it was, mm -hmm. and, and how much. Uh, as I was watching, I was, thinking, I was thinking, "This is all about number theory, and it's all about patterns, and it's all about algebra." Right. Right. And those, there was certainly work with the objects, but mm -hmm. the goal was very clear. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was something when you were talking with Templary that was important about the name structure, and I loved your answer and how you showed it. The name actually came from Max Bertheimer, mm -hmm. who is a Gestalt psych, uh, psychologist, and who my grandmother was. She worked for in the early '40s for several years as his assistant, and he was apparently so the lore was within the family, upset that she had figured this all out before she had read his theory. <laughs> <laughs> and he then said, this is about uh, think it, thinking in a structured way. Right. Right. And um, talks about it in his book. But what is the productive thinking? Productive thinking. Talks <clears throat> about the method and was very struck by it. Right. So he so, named it. He named it, yeah. Oh, he named he the... gave He gave her that, and he said, ah. you've got to call this the structural arithmetic method. Very because, interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. And so what is the role of modifications to the method now is, uh, with uh, teachers improvising on, on the method? Is that a good idea? I think any time that the teachers can understand the underlying excitement and, and structures, the mathematical structures, and other ways of helping kids discover things. The, the method is about setting up situations where the child has insight into the underlying structure, feels his own capacity to think. So clearly one wants to foster that in teachers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and anything that helps bring that joy both to the teacher and to the student would be welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of teachers have had themselves often not such good experiences with mathematics and, mm -hmm. and their learning of it. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm interested in sort of the baggage we bring to various right. situations. Mm -hmm. And so I think Temple's unusual in that she does bring a real excitement about learning, and that comes through again and again, both with your work with the kids, but also when you were interviewing her. Yeah. She, right feels the freshness of her own, of what she sees, of right. what she understands, right. and sees the kids enjoy that freshness right. themselves. And there were occasions when the kids came up with rules that he did not anticipate. And I, and I saw how she was exploring with the kids what that rule was, was all about. Right, right. The, the, one of the nice things with the sandwich game was that they had such different ways of getting to the, the yeah. neighbors. Yes. You know, they, the, you know, and they had the sum of the neighbors, then how do you then figure out what it was a sum of, what two numbers. And they had three or four different ways to do it. And I think one of the things that, as a psychologist, I've always valued about the method is the self-reliance that kids then have on their own minds. Mm -hmm. they, they, they know that if they can't solve something one way, they've had a really deep experience knowing that they can solve it a different way, mm -hmm. so that they don't feel that helplessness that I think we feel when we can't solve something with a computer. Right. When right. the computer, you just don't have an analogy for, right. for making it work. But with physical objects, there are many, way, many solutions. Right. And I think Temple helps build that, and materials lend themselves to that. We are in a restaurant the other night where the computer broke down, and they could not figure out the bill. We said, could you write on a piece of paper? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've never done this. <laughs> you know, it was remarkable.